My guest this week is a family medicine physician and author of three books, including Human Rights Violations in Medicine. We're going to explore some underlying reasons behind why physicians have the highest rate of suicide among all professions. We'll also look at what you should know and some surprising small things that might prevent another tragic death. She's based in Oregon and recently set up residence in New York City, and one might think dealing with such a painful, solemn subject might make her demeanor a bit sad. But you'd be wrong on that, as she took that first step, courageous step, onto a New York City stage and performed her first stand-up comedy routine in December. All this and more today on Winning Healthcare Food Fights Without the Mess. Welcome to the show, the physician's guardian angel, Dr. Pamela Weibel. Thank you. It's so good to be here. Well, let me start by saying I only had an inkling of physician suicides before I heard of you and your mission. And then I started taking a deeper dive into it. And then I found your TED Talk and I went, oh yeah, here we go. I need to listen to this. And then I found your website, idealmedicalcare.org. And one thing that's immediately apparent is this is a deeply personal passion for you. And what I'd like to do is focus on the individuals first, because I know there's a whole backstory behind you know, medical school and residency, but the physicians, the med students, the nurses, veterinarians too, are taking this ultimate tragic step. So I thought it would be good to explore the reasons and perhaps some misconceptions behind these suicides. You've been there. And I guess the best way of saying it is that you have a firsthand view. You were on the ledge, so to speak. So Pam, your, your story is important and highly relevant. So maybe a little bit about your own story and then we can talk about what physicians are going through and nurses and, and med students and residents. But what's your story? So both my parents are physicians and I grew up going to work with them as a little kid. So I was very fortunate. I was able to see medicine in its heyday when it was an awesome profession, when mm -hmm. patients really respected their physicians. Physicians went 110% for the patients. You know, they uh, did house calls and uh, it was just like the ideal medical care that all of us would aspire to have today. And, you know, without all the technological advances, of course, um, but essentially the human relationship was intact and it was a very fulfilling profession. Uh, fast forward, you know, I went into medicine. My parents uh, did warn me not to pursue medicine because I think they had a sense that all this third party intrusion and complexity was coming and the beauty of the re human relationship was going to dissipate mm -hmm. and it was going to be a tough, uh, you know, tough career and maybe more litigation and, you know, just not, yeah. not as fun. You couldn't bring your daughter to work every day, you know, today, like they could years ago uh. Uh, with all the rules and regulations and all of that. So uh, fast forward, I, I do everything right. K through 12, college, med school, board certified family doc. I'm finally ready to rock and roll. Uh, I start my first job. I'm about, uh, I think, 28 at the time. And uh, what I experience is the feeling of being a factory worker on an assembly line. This did not feel uh, at all like what it, what it was in the 1970s, what physicians were years ago. And so I thought, oh, maybe this is just kind of a bad job that I picked. So I tried six jobs in 10 years. They were all what I call assembly line medicine, which really sucks for the patient <laughs> and for the doctor. I think sure. sometimes patients don't really recognize, you know, when they're miserable, uh, so is your doctor. <laughs> right. Your doctor's miserable too. And, you know, you can go home and spend the rest of your life with your family, but the doctor is stuck in this miserable situation day in and day out in this terrible job all the time. Mm. So that's what actually led to my suicidal thoughts, the dark night of the soul, you know, because if you think about it, I put like all my eggs in one basket. I feel like I was born to be a healer. I did everything right. I made straight A's, you know, I took all the tests and, you know, in the end, I felt like I was captive 
in a very dysfunctional system, and that led to my suicidal thinking. Mm. So the, that, that's a good um, intro as to why physicians are thinking the way they do. And this is not just an American issue. I just read something. It's a global issue. Yeah. A third of UK docs report, quote unquote, burnout, and we'll get to that word, and compassion fatigue. And there's one thing that we should talk about right now, and that's burnout, because that's the wrong word. It absolutely is the wrong word. I mean, burnout, I think one of the problems we're having in solving this crisis is recognizing the truth of what the crisis is, right? And mm -hmm. backtrack a little bit on suicide. We've known that doctors have had a high suicide rate compared to the general population since 1858 in the UK when it was first reported. So we've had, you know, 160 plus years to deal with this. And my, sadly, my profession has done very little about it. And the reason why we're not getting any traction is because it's been a secret, right? What I actually consider to be the problem is not even suicide. It's the secrecy. Because mm -hmm. if we could take it out of secrecy, secrecy, we actually have the brain power and resourcefulness to solve this, but not when it's a secret. You see what I'm saying? A little transparency. Right. A lot of transparency. And that's the same thing with burnout. Burnout has been used to sort of cover up more serious mental health issues among doctors. And it's actually an inappropriate term to be used as applied to physicians. And let me explain why. So the history of burnout is it was a word used by end-stage drug uh, addicts in the oh, 1970s. Yeah. I Right. I, I, I was in high school from 73 to 77. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> right. So, so like you were a burnout if you were like laying there in an alley with a needle up your arm. You're burning out. Right. And oh, yeah. uh, so it's a slang term. Right. Mm -hmm. From inner city America. And then what happened is uh, Herbert Freudenberger was a psychologist at the time who was actually volunteering at a free clinic in inner city New York with uh, drug addicted people. And <laughs> Apparently, he started using their term and applying it to his feelings in dealing with them, right? Because uh, it's a difficult population to help. <laughs> you know what I yeah. mean? So he started to say, and I don't know that he even originated it. He just popularized it. I think that, it, you know, how slang uh, sure. terms become, you know, part, they end up in the dictionary, right? Uh, if they're used enough, right? So I think the staff, uh, social workers and such dealing with end stage drug addicted folks started applying that term to themselves because they just felt probably complete frustration and compassion fatigue, right? From mm -hmm. trying to help these folks, right? And then Herbert Freudenberger wrote a book, you know, about, you know, burnout and perfectionist, burnout and this and burnout and that. And, you know, it started, you know, it was on Oprah or whatever. And you end up, the whole population wants to say they're burned out. Bus drivers, housewives, you know. Girlfriends. Care workers, <laughs> girlfriends, you know. And you have to really think about this. If there's a term that applies to everyone, it probably doesn't apply to anyone. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's yeah. so loot in its meaning. What is, what is it really, right? And if you think about mental health stigma, which is actually part of the problem that leads to suicide because people feel so much shame enough to keep it a secret, that's part of the reason I think why the word burnout became so popular is it's much easier to say I'm burned out than I'm in a terrible marriage and my husband beats me <laughs> or mm -hmm. I'm burned out. Uh, but my boss is a douche and, you know, whatever else you want to say about your terrible life. And you know what I mean? Right. So I think we've latched onto a term that has very little meaning, even though they've created like all these criteria and measurements and tools and this and that. And the other thing, the point is that we're not getting anywhere. I mean, to cut through the chase here, you know, we're not solving the problem by talking about a word that's a misdiagnosis for a whole group of people. I mean, we've been at it for 40 years, talking about physician burnout. It started to be applied to physicians in 1981 in medical literature, and we've made literally zero progress, and we've gone, you know, it's even getting worse, right? Because, sure. uh, but meanwhile, to keep this in the, you know, medical realm, we've made a lot of progress with so many other things, you know, lung transplants, mapping out the human genome. Think about all the medical progress we've made in the last 40 years and all sorts of other uh, areas of the human body, right? Right. 
but we're like at a standstill with burnout because quite honestly, it's a misdiagnosis. It's really about end stage drug addiction and it doesn't begin to even scratch the surface on what's going on psychologically with physicians in a medical education system in which we've been groomed to accept abuse as normal. Yeah. Self neglect and self abuse. Let me, let me ask this because I, I have the impression that it's a different thought process going on with physicians versus the rest of the, let's just say the general public that it seems to me the general public has sort of this, this, increasing sense of this isn't right you know they they're kind of going in a slow spiral down and then they get to that point where they say okay i've had enough whereas physicians as i'm as i'm reading and please correct me if i'm wrong this this is a snap decision in a lot of these am i right or how how are they different if is there a difference the difference is that physicians, you're talking about suicide, right. I think right now, right. are highly compartmentalized and trained to keep, you know, the game face on, you know, and smile with a starched white coat. And when you kind of hide all your feelings in a, basically a training program that has groomed you to live a life of professional distance and dissociation with yourself to play the role of what's considered a physician, right? Mm -hmm. you, accepted your profession's, um, you know, uh, mandate to, you know, put patients first 24 seven, um, you know, your bathing needs, bathroom, the meals, seeing your family that comes secondary, right? If you want to be a good doctor, you've got to be able to work these 36 hour shifts. And so what happens is that we get acclimated and, and adjusted to this new world that we're in, which is um, being a physician all the time, really no personal life, because let's just face it, if you're on an airplane, even going on a vacation, if somebody calls for medical help, you got to bounce up out of your seat. You know what I mean? You're never right. really, uh, they're not calling for IT help on an airplane. You know what I mean? I mean, you, the computer tech next to you is actually taking a vacation. Right. I mean, even when you get to Hawaii, if you're by the pool and a kid's drowning, you're jumping in and doing that too. You're never on vacation. Right. You're always at the beck and call. You're always aware. Yeah. You're always hyper vigilant to the needs of other people. Yeah. And, and so that takes a terrible toll on you personally. You know, when I heard from a psychiatry intern that she only saw her newborn infant six waking hours of her life during the first six months of her residency, you know, that is shocking. Oof. That is what I would call human rights violations and maternal deprivation that's now going to have psychological impacts on the child's future, you know, lack of attachment to the mother. Yeah. You mentioned 36 hour shifts and I was just thinking in terms of sleep medicine, uh, which I was involved with for a little while. Uh, sleep sensors, and you go for a certain amount of hours of without sleep, and you're technically drunk. Yeah, it's it, it's about uh, I think they say 17 hours. Around 17 hours, you're at 0 0.05 percent. Um, at like I forget, like 24 hours, you're at 0.1. You know, so basically, you're not safe to drive a motor vehicle in the United States. Um, every country has its own little cutoff. Utah's truckers do. Truckers have a limit. Yeah, truckers actually, I, I ended up at a, you know what's so funny? I, I spent about a few months ago, I went and hung out at a truck stop uh, where all the truckers um, come in uh, to rest on their, you know, I wanted to interview them about their sleep habits, you know? So I was sitting in the, I don't know, they had a little like TV room. I mean, they let me in there and just hang out with truckers, you know, for several hours. And I just asked them like, hey, you know, like how long can you really drive your truck? They're like, oh man, ever since they put these sensors on our truck, you know, they basically, an alarm goes off, it's connected to the engine, right? An alarm will go off at seven and a half hours and you have to stop your truck. Like it's not an option, you're stopping your truck and you're gonna get out wow. and you're gonna, you're gonna check your truck and, um, and you're only gonna work a certain number of hours per day and, and, the, and the beginning of those hours is all about sort of walking around the truck and making sure everything's strapped down properly and checking the wheels and you know, like they have this whole, this whole protocol that they follow. But let me assure you, there, there's no trucker in the United States that's driving more than seven and a half hours without stopping or they're getting in huge trouble. 
you know, because their employer hears that little alarm go off, right? And they get yeah. dinged, right? And yeah. so um, now in Canada, they don't have that thing attached to the, uh, they're still using paper logs, you know, like the honor hmm. system, sort of, right? And so it's just really interesting to see that uh, in medicine, you're going to walk in and potentially go to the emergency room and see somebody who's been up 30 hours. That you might know, be the first question you ask your doctor. How long? I mean, if I were going to the ER, I'd say, when was the last time you got any rest? Right. Oh, yeah, because even if they have 12 hours off, they're not necessarily sleeping. They're trying to do their laundry, go to the bathroom and, um, you know, take care of the other, you know, take, take you know, walk their dog or something. You yeah. know, like when are they getting quality sleep? They don't. I mean, they really don't. Because I mean, they're rare. still they're perfectionists. And even when you go home, you're worried, like, wait a minute. Did I run the right lab test? What were the results? Let me call and see what happened to this one. You know, like you can't let go of these people that you cared for. They're still right. in your mind circulating around. So even if you were getting into REM sleep, I just don't know the quality of it <laughs> for yeah. doctors. On a, on a scale of one to 10 with one being low, where, where are we at with public awareness of this problem with, with physicians? I mean, uh, 1.5, I don't know, very low, pretty low. Why, why is that? I think because public safety, uh, people want to feel like there's someone in charge. You know, it's, I don't think people want to live in anarchy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's unsettling to most people. If you thought the people who are in charge of our health were likely to die by th suicide three times the rate that you would, you know, choose suicide, mm -hmm. that's unsettling to people. <laughs> A little. <laughs> I uh, might just change into my brown trousers. <laughs> right. uh, yeah, they they don't want to think about it. It's 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 too wow. scary to think about. It's too scary to think about the reality of what's happening. So people just run around talking about burnout and wellness. So let's do yoga, have a green drink, um, you know, in, in medical, I think because by the way, it's still, it's still too scary, even within medical circles to address the reality of the situation, which is why people are doing all these, you know, let's color in an adult coloring book. And, you know, like they do all these really weird things without specifically saying, wow, I think we have a human rights violation situation situation happening here. You know what I mean? Like handing sense. out coloring books at Auschwitz or something. Like we're not going to get anywhere. You know what I mean? If we don't actually say out loud human rights violations, uh, which is what this is. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm laughing at the coloring books at Auschwitz. And the reason I'm laughing is, is that you had a stand-up routine that you just did. And we're going to get to that. But it's corporate wellness programs. They don't really work. I mean, yeah, hello. I think you probably have some personal experience with that, like, yeah. uh, you know, oh, corporations work or don't work and the effects on the human psyche. Right. Yeah. Well, one of the things, and, I, and I, I really want to commend you on this, I just read human rights violations in medicine. And, and I'm, I'm a patient. Thank you for reading that. It must have been scary, but... Um, yeah, you know, I sent you an email about half, well, 60 pages in, and, and it was like, what the... This can't be happening. This just can't be. You know, scary but empowering. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And as a patient, I, I got so much out of it because I really do appreciate what's the backstory that you don't see on Chicago Med and, and ER and Grey's Anatomy. And maybe you see it in the resident TV show, but there's nothing cultural out there that really shows this. They don't want to, at least as far as I can tell. Maybe there, I haven't seen the resident, but. Yeah. You know, I don't, I, don't see, I don't think culturally people really understand what's going on with medicine because TV is presenting. I, I think there's a timing issue because if you were to, you know, yes, I might be 20 years ahead in my depth of understanding on a topic that's been shielded in secrecy for a century. But if I were to unleash the full um, version of what I have in my brain onto even my co-workers uh, who are physicians or, uh, or patients, I think I'd give everyone PTSD. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> you can't unleash this amount of information on people without having them go into a complete state of hopelessness, right? So I think sometimes what's useful about television is it releases some of this in bits and pieces over years, you know, so that finally, when we do talk about suicide, there's enough of an awareness through some of these, 
watered down TV shows, you know, that are yeah. producing new concepts at a slow level so that people, you know, can actually take it in versus yeah. being stunned and turn off the TV show, right? Yeah, it's like getting little drabs of Auschwitz, you know, instead of watching the colorized version of what's right. coming out now. And it, we need yeah. to keep that. I'm not, I'm not dwelling on it. I just thought of it that you look at some of those, those films of it, the real thing, not Schindler's List. That was horrible enough. But the real thing. And now they're colorizing these things. It's just, ah. And your book, and I encourage people to read this, and the reason is that they will gain a new appreciation of what's going on behind the scenes, what their doctor is going through. And there's an example, and maybe it was you or someone else. Here's an ER physician coming out and telling some, you know, apologizing that they're 15 minutes late giving someone a pill. And, they're, and the, person, the, the, the person there, the family member is angry at the doctor. But what they don't know is that you know, five minutes before they're dealing with uh, consoling a parent that just lost a child. I mean, I, I mean, th that's that compartmentalization of it. Now we're going to get into a little bit of the backstory, but there's a backstory with you writing it, right? I mean, I would assume that if anyone who, who sits at a word processor, and, you know, opens up word and starts writing, there's a motivation there. And I can tell what the motivation is, but what's the backstory? Did you sit down one day and say, okay, I'm doing this? Oh, the backstory is uh, after I was suicidal myself and sort of survived by launching my own practice, um, I started helping other doctors go into independent practice. And um, eight years into my, my clinic, I was found myself sitting at the third funeral, you know, in town within a year and a half for a physician who had died by suicide. And see, at the time when I was suicidal, I thought I was the only suicidal physician that ever walked the planet. I just thought, okay, I've been an odd bird my whole life. I'm kind of fringy. I'm, you know, like, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm sensitive. I'm idealistic, you know, gee, there's probably just something wrong with me. You know, like I just attributed my suicidal thoughts to my innate sensitivity and all that, right? But come to find out eight years later, after three guys in my town, top of their careers, you know, died by suicide. I was wow. sitting there in the second row of his memorial service. I just started thinking, you know, geez, wait a minute now. I mean, this is the third one. Wait a minute. I think this is an occupational hazard. You know, like what is going on here? It's more than this one man, right? And so I just started counting on my fingers how many doctors uh, I personally knew who had died by suicide or uh, circumstances extremely suspicious for suicide, you know, that were covered up by accidental overdose or something mm -hmm. like that, which I think is impossible in physicians, you know, because we know what these drugs can do because we dose them every day. We're not like a toddler crawling in the bathroom with right. playing pills, right? So. So basically I, I counted 10, you know, and I thought, okay, I'm in my early forties. I know 10 people in my field who have died by suicide, including both men I dated in medical school uh, who died mm. not while dating me, but later married to other women with children. Right. Wow. And, um, you know, and, and when I had that realization, it sort of took over my life. That was October 28th, 2012 at 3 PM. And pretty much ever since then, this has been on the forefront of my mind. And because I've been so invested in this topic and then writing about it and speaking about it people just kind of see me as the sort of ground zero you know the smithsonian of doctor suicides if you have a su suicide you've experienced from a physician call pamela it's under the picture you know my whole house started to look like a shrine to dead doctors i mean basically at this point i've got close to 1400 doctor suicides that i've investigated personally myself you know Right. Uh, because, by the way, the police department and, and the medical institutions don't research these. I mean, they'll research them enough to say at the police whether it's a homicide or suicide, and then they submit their report and it's over. But when you have 1,400 in one profession, I think it deserves more of an investigation than just, oh, it wasn't a homicide. You know what I mean? There's a natural desire. Is uh, Well, okay, let me just throw this out there. I would assume that there's a natural desire to not for the for the system whether it's the police or the coroners or whatever you know this is a doctor we can't we can't that's that we can't say it was a suicide we just shouldn't do that oh yeah there's definitely a tendency to cover these up which is why i feel like the statistics that we have on you know occupational suicides you know by profession are 
um, warped <laughs> because uh, first of all, we're hiding these um, and physicians are better at hiding their suicides than probably anyone else. Okay. Yeah. And, and that's just the victim hiding their own suicide, right? They, they drive off a bridge and then they say it's, you know, an accident or whatever, but also our colleagues, our surviving colleagues are in a state of denial about just our own mortality. Um, and also they don't want to, you know, look who's filling out your death certificate, your friend who you go to church within your small town who's also a physician or the medical examiner right and so there is sort of this weird psychological pressure going on in the person who's actually going to declare whether it was a suicide or not for them to say it wasn't because you know let's just face it your wife or husband might not get an insurance payout um you know it's the reputation you know you go to church with this person you know what i mean so now yeah. i mean there's feeling of of hiding it let's hide it you know and since we don't have the suicide note, we'll just say it was, um, and even when they do have the suicide note, they've even said that it was an accident. So interesting. Wow. Um, wow. So there's, there's a lot of hiding going on. And, and then um, it just makes it obviously that much more difficult to solve a problem. Like if we hid Ebola or hid, if we, if we allowed, this is here, and this is interesting because of what's going on in the world now with the coronavirus, right? If mm -hmm. we allowed people in Wuhan to just hide their family members at home who had coronavirus and just leave it up to the family to decide, you know, that's not a way to handle a public health crisis. You have to have hazmat suits and people coming in who are like authorities that know how to contain an epidemic, right? But with physician suicide, which has been at crisis levels, I mean, more than a million Americans lose their doctors to suicide every year. We're just sort of allowing, well, well, let's let the family decide how they want to handle this, or let's just do a GoFundMe page. Well, that's kind of a ridiculous way to handle a public health crisis, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And we'll leave it to the family. The grieving family has no extra uh, like energy to do anything. They can hardly get out of bed. You right. know what I mean? So we can't put them at the helm of a public health crisis. So to get back to why I wrote this book, I, you know, I went into medicine because I'm here to help uh, prevent death and ease suffering. And so when I find that 10 of my colleagues have died by suicide, I guess I just appointed myself uh, to lead an investigation uh, for personal purposes because I wanted to find out why my friends are dying. You put on the detective hat. Every doctor I've had a conversation with, part of the reasons they, they love being a doctor is the problem solving. They, they love putting on their detective hats and playing medical detective. And in primary care, that's where you have all the variables. And I mean, there are a lot more variables. You're looking at the entire human body plus the environment plus a lot of other things. So it's a great place. If you want to be if you want to be a medical Sherlock Holmes boy, primary care is a great place to be. Oh, I love how you said that. That's absolutely true. Um, people tried to convince me to go into pediatrics and you know other um, specialties because I seem to have a knack for those in my training. And it was like, man, I cannot exclude any organ system, any age, any medical condition. Man, I got. I want to see the whole thing. You know. Yeah, it was Dr. Lou Hoffman, who I credit using the Sherlock Holmes analogy there. So I want to credit him for that. He was a, he was a White House physician. And after he left the White House, he went on to become, uh, what was it, flight surgeon for Air Force One. Wow. And uh, I met him at a corporate function. So I, I have to credit him. That was, that was interesting. He was leaving the next day to go to China to teach the Chinese what they found out about acupuncture. <laughs> interesting. Yeah. They're not, they're not cut and dried you know, by the book, they, they definitely think outside the box. And it was, it was really interesting talking to him, but he's the one who came up with the Sherlock Holmes thing. But there's also, and I'll throw this out here, there's a backstory of what's driving this, and you're starting to delve into that. It's the system and the culture, and it starts in med school. So let's focus there a bit. There's a, there's a culture problem with the training and it's been a male dominated profession for a long, long time. <laughs> and only in the last, what, 100 years, maybe 50 years, I don't know, you can correct me, that far more females have joined the profession. Great. But you have this high testosterone factor. And the other thing that 
my perception of med school being tough was it helps weed out people who are there for the wrong reason. They're there for status or money or some other need instead of serving the patients, which you felt. I mean, that's obvious. So to my mind, that's kind of, that kind of makes sense. But after reading your book, this is, this has gone entirely too far. So over, over to you. I, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts about, you know, med school and, and why we are where we're at. Well, I think in order to understand where we are today, you have to look back, you know, maybe 150 years ago when medical schools were popping up all over the country and anyone could go with just sort of a high school degree and a hundred bucks. I think that was the entrance and it was, that was, that was what the, um, you know, requirements. <laughs> and then, um, Sometimes people were becoming physicians just by apprenticing with other physicians. And of course there was like homeopathy and all sorts of other healing arts. And you know, it wasn't just sort of MDs. So basically what happened that really turned the whole thing around is in 1889 at Johns Hopkins, uh, they started the very first surgical residency um, and started a medical school, by the way, that required a college degree and more than just, you know, like, like you, you couldn't just be a high school student with a wealthy family at the time with an extra hundred bucks, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so the very first surgical residency was started at Johns Hopkins by a man named William Halstead, who was a cocaine addicted surgeon who actually learned how to be a surgeon by watching surgeries in Europe and Germany, uh, because we didn't, you know, if you think way back when, we didn't have any surgical, you know, how do we start a profession when no profession exists? You know what I mean? Mm, how, how does yeah. the first surgeon actually become a surgeon if we don't have any training programs for surgeons, <laughs> right? So if you look back in time, you see this man, William Halstead, who trained in Germany, uh, apparently they had a method of training that was pretty darn cutthroat there. Um, and he adapted that method of training for the U.S. and created this program, which would be an eight year program to become a surgeon after medical, after, you know, medical school. And it was a pyramidal structure, meaning like there were only a few people that end up completing, you know, to his satisfaction to get, you know, the the certificate right to be a surgeon right mm -hmm. and uh it was it was a lot of competition so people were pitted against each other in a weeding out process where only you know a few would survive and they had to move into the hospitals pretty much take a vow of celibacy you know weren't allowed to get married or any you know he you know it was suggested that you not have a personal life at all and you live in the hospital okay wow. So that's eight years of, you know, sort of 24 seven availability in the hospital for a, a group of people and only a few would survive kind of like a gladiator fight in a hospital. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so that's um, still impacting us. And the fact that he was on cocaine is very relevant because I think he felt like people should be able to accomplish as much as he could, right? When you're on cocaine and you're skilled, he, he does have like native skills that are incredible of this man, William Halstead, right? So I'm not dissing him. He was, he was really good at what he did. He wasn't not necessarily a good teacher. He was really good at performing surgery and research not a great teacher and he was on cocaine, right? So, so basically he, I think had a really, um, he was very finicky too, by the way, he would order his shirts just as an, an example of his personality. He would order his shirts from like Europe and he did, couldn't find anyone in Baltimore that would iron them properly. So he'd ship them back to Europe to get them cleaned and ironed properly. You know what I mean? Like this is, this is the guy that started medical, you know, a perfectionist who couldn't tolerate any mistakes was at the helm of creating medical education, right? Oh, Lord. <laughs> so that's why we still have this feeling like you've got a big brother, William Halstead, over your shoulder, wanting you to work 36 hours and shut up and not see your kids and be dedicated. And people have the long-term mental health impacts that are now passed on generation to generation from physicians as a result of this man. Yeah who was great at surgery and thank him for the surgical advances, including rubber gloves, right? right. We have to thank him for many different things. They're However, he had a terrible effect on physician mental health, which is still, we're still reeling from the results of his methods. 
and medicine. Right. Were, by the way, adopted to all their residency programs. So all their uh, residency programs were modeled after the surgical residency program. Medicine has changed so much just in the last 20 years since when we had um, genome was announced the, in July 26, 2000. So that's when you as a physician, you knew, okay, this is, this is a big deal because at some point it's going to come down to primary care. In other words, you're going to be looking at a genome in primary care. They're about 250 bucks now, depending on where you go, to have one mapped. That's clearly in your realm as a primary care doctor. And that's just one thing. There's got microbiome, there's all sorts of tests, and there's so many more variables just in the last 20 years. But medicine has changed just in 20, but the last 50 years, it's, it's been phenomenal. I'll throw this out here. We have residency, uh, med school, and then residency. And so the culture, culture differences between med school and residency, it's about, is it about the same? I mean, it's the same kind of stuff they get in med school, they get in residency, or is it because- It's similar, though I have to say there are many, many progressive med schools um, now, and you could potentially create a very nurturing environment for your medical students, but what really freaks out some of these progressive deans at medical schools is that as soon as they graduate, you're throwing them into the lion's den back into the gladiator pit. You know what I mean? So uh. it's much more difficult to control what goes on at residency because of these insane shit, you know, 28 plus hour shifts that are still legal for physicians to work. So even though you can create, you know, such a sweet, you know, medical school experience, if you wanted to, and I'm not saying all medical schools do that, but it is possible. Mm -hmm. uh, it's residency is really, um, can be life threatening for some people and can create mental health impacts that if they don't kill you during residency, you may have lifelong insomnia, constipation that you didn't once have, IBS, you know, like all sorts of conditions, um, hypervigilance, poor sleep, all sorts of things, mental health conditions that will follow you the rest of your life. Which is why, again, I have trouble with the term burnout because it's like these people have been groomed in a system that has given them mental health conditions that they're still carrying from their training. Yeah. And they're not able to defend themselves or get treatment. When I think of this training regime and, and it, in terms of the can't cut it type culture, and, and I'm recalling Bud's training for Navy SEALs, basic underwater demolition school. I mean, that's a military culture and weeding out those who can't cut it. That was a big deal. And if you can handle buds, you can better handle combat. I mean, there's a whole reason why they do what they do, but there's something else a lot of people don't know. It also f promotes, fosters, and instills a team culture. And they weed out the Rambo types. They want to get rid of those guys, contrary to what people might think. In medical school and then in residency, I get the impression that it's not a team culture. Even though I think medicine is more team focused now, you have care teams because you just can't handle everything by yourself. I mean, this is my impression. So, so please tell me, take it from there. Tell me if I'm on the right track or. Oh, you're totally on the right track. I've compared military to medicine quite often. I don't know if you've seen that uh, blog that I wrote in 2016, which was a letter that I published from a medical student. She told me she was less, she was in the army reserve. Okay. She said she was less stressed in Afghanistan under active oh, yeah. sniper fire than medical school. Wow. Okay. Wow. And so, you know, I had to call her and unpack that because it's like, well, that's a pretty dramatic statement there. But the, what it came down to is she knew on the battlefield that her comrades had her back. If she was blown to smithereens with a landmine, she knew they would pick up her body pieces and bring her back to the United States and she would have an honored funeral and her parents would get the little purple heart, you know, whatever they do, there would be a process for honoring her life, right? Mm -hmm. um, what's absolutely um, so stressful 
and completely shatters um, the, the feeling of safety within people training in medicine is the fact that uh, your colleagues don't have your back. You know, this is a gladiator competition, you know, and it's like survival of the fittest and the survival might be one person, right? So you can't depend on your comrades. See, in military, you know who the enemy is and you know who's on your team. Right. In medicine, you don't know who's really on your team. I mean, I guess the enemy is the disease and inside the patient. However, because of the culture that's been set up around medical education, no matter how no matter how much you use the term, you know, these lip service terms, teamwork, team <laughs> huddle, let's do a huddle in the morning, all these cutesy little things, you know, you know, when you have eight years of knowing that the person next to you, next to you would take your spot in a minute if you got leukemia <laughs> and knock you out, you know, what I mean, that's yeah. not. That's not teamwork, right? So, or if yeah. you died by suicide, you know, if, if nobody would come to your funeral and everyone would just show up the next day and say, "I guess he was weak." Yeah, that that doesn't lead to teamwork, and it doesn't it doesn't even begin to solve the problem, prevent the problem, right? You know, so switching gears just a little bit, you mentioned you grew up in medicine. Your father was a pathologist working in a morgue, right? And so for a very young age, here's what, you're six years old? Mm -hmm. You went into the morgue and did you like ever pull a toe tag and expect a reaction? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I saw blood coming down off that little chute like during, you know, I, I saw, I mean, I wasn't tall enough to look over and see the autopsy happening, but I saw the body parts, I saw the blood. I, I mean, I was there for the visceral experience of this is death and isn't this interesting. And it didn't scare me because my dad loved his job. You know, that was the beautiful thing about it. My dad had such a passion for pathology and he's so OCD. Like I just followed him around and I was mesmerized by all the cool things he was doing. You know? did, he ever, did he ever pull any pranks on you? Or I, was that just, you, you? he wouldn't have done that? Was he, was it, he just, I don't no. think he did pranks. That's not his style, but he definitely sort of had me there. In a way, he also, by the way, worked at a methadone clinic and uh, at the city wow. jail before breathalyzers. They had live doctors, you know, in a sniffing wow. drunk drivers for alcohol. Um, <laughs> he didn't bring you there though. Oh, I was there. I was at all those places. I went to wow. work with him everywhere. Like, I mean, I literally, including he was on call for the Philadelphia Fire Department. So we would go out in the middle of the night to huge apartment fires, you know, like consider, I mean, who would take their kid to a nine, you know, nine eleven experience? You know what I mean? Nine one. I mean, it's just, you know, I felt like I was seeing things that most parents or most people would try to shield themselves their entire life from even reading a book about stuff like this. But I was right there smelling the smoke. My seeing goodness. the body parts, seeing the blood, you know, and he, my dad had a whole jar, a huge glass jar full of foreign bodies he found inside of people. And Philadelphia was the number one homicide city in the country at that time. And it was filled with like bullets and IUDs and all these fake testicles. He'd let me stick my hands in there and feel things and bring out bullets, you know, like I'm touching bullets that killed people. You wow. know what I mean? As a yeah. child. As so, a child. <laughs> I mean... I'll tell you something. I'm comparing, and I thought I had an interesting child, well, you know, young adult. My dad used to teach creative problem solving, and one of his clients was the National Foundation of Funeral Service. I got to know funeral directors, and they're very solemn. You know, you go to a funeral home, they're very solemn people, and they're very reserved and, and kindly. And, but boy, you go to a convention of funeral directors in Vegas, and oh my God. <laughs> Everything cuts loose, and thank God they're in Vegas because what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. But they said something very interesting to me, and it's a life lesson that I, I, I share. And they said, you know, one of the things that we see as funeral directors in our homes, you see the families come in, you see friends come in, and they stand over the coffin, and they say, why didn't I tell you I love you more? Why didn't I tell you you were a great friend? Why didn't I tell you you were this to me? And they would stand there and see this and say, why don't people do that? They should. It's, it's something that the regret that they have and they don't need, they should just say it. Just say it. Mm -hmm. Don't wait because there's going to come a day when you're not going to be able to do it. Yeah. So you've got people calling you on the phone and they're saying, I'm at the edge of my rope or whatever. 
they're really at a, in a bad place. So common sense to me says that you yourself have got to take time for self-renewal. And then not long ago in New York City, you got up and did a stand-up comedy routine, death row stand-up comedy routine. God bless you for that. I love it when people do that because that's not easy. That's a very tough thing to do. As any comedian who you know has been around a while, not that I am, but the ones that I've seen interviewed. So what motivated you to step on that stage? Uh, this is what motivated me. First of all, uh, I'm one of these odd birds that I've never had stage fright. Like I love being on stage. So <laughs> there's no fear. I don't have fear. Uh, I really don't. But uh, what happened, so I do a lot of keynotes speaking around the country and speak at, you know, medical school commencements and such. And what started happening, really what thrust me onto that stage for doing stand-up comedy is that I started noticing in the last few keynotes I did that people were like rolling around laughing, you know, and I was getting standing ovations when I'm talking about suicide. And I couldn't figure out like, Believe me, never, I mean, I can understand getting a standing ovation if you're giving a speech on Martin Luther King's birthday or doing <laughs> something where people are like, yeah, like this is, you know, or a birthday party, you know, something, but a suicide speech, never in my life did I ever think that you could get a standing ovation talking about suicide, right? And then, I mean, so that, that started happening, you know, back, you know, maybe five years ago. Um, and I've never had a standing ovation on any other topic, only suicide, right? And I talk about some fun topics too, right? So, but then when people started laughing through my talks, you know, then I'm like, what the hell? You know, this is just nuts. Like, okay. So basically because people were, so I record all my talks. And I was um, analyzing because I'm trying to figure out obviously how to be better, how to, you know, there's so much material I want to get out without scaring people. If there's a way that I'm saying something that's more effective, right. you know, I want to take note of it. So in listening to my talk that I gave at the psychiatric convention, uh, where it was like a five day event. And I was, you know, the people wrote me afterwards thanking me. They're like, I was there all five days. You were the only one that got a standing ovation. Your talk was great. You know, like I'm getting all this fan mail. I'm listening to the thing. And I realized that like people are laughing sometimes three times per minute when I'm talking. Right. Mm. And so I just Googled how many laughs per minute do you need to be a stand up comedian? Because I felt like I was already being one and I didn't understand what I was doing because the laughter was taking me by surprise. And I, it was sort of, an, the laughter was an inconvenience because I couldn't go to my next slide because I had to wait for them to stop laughing. The rhythm, but, yeah. Yeah, I didn't know they were gonna laugh. You know what I mean? <laughs> so the thing is that I had, like I wanted to have more control over the audience to try to figure out why they're laughing so that I could utilize my material better to help people learn, I guess you could say, right? Mm -hmm. And so I just realized that you needed four to six laughs per minute to be a, a like a professional stand-up comedian, I was like, oh my God, I'm one laugh per minute short. I might as well just try to see how to do stand-up comedy so I could utilize that as a technique yeah. when I'm speaking about mental health. Right? So that's one of the things you do to sort of release and, and kind of throw off the, the suppressive influence that you, that people have who are dealing with things. You know, the people calling you, writing you and saying, hey, I'm, I'm really in a bad place. And that puts you in a, in a position where you need time to get away from that. And mm -hmm. it's tough to do, but it's a lesson learned. And I'm wondering, because your mom was a psychiatrist, and, and so you also grew up with those deep insights into mental health. And I suppose it's fair to say you were cosmically predisposed to becoming the physician's guardian angel. <laughs> I think so. I think so. I, I believe we, this is my philosophy. I believe we choose our parents before we're born. And if I was meant to help wounded healers, of course, I'd have two wounded healers as parents that I could work on from day one. And if I failed, you know, my childhood survival would be at, at, at risk. You know what I mean? Like you sort of, I had to master physician psychology to survive my childhood. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you were definitely you. Were, it was cosmic. Yeah. To to use a phrase from my very early youth, very cosmic. And then it's so funny because some psychiatrists, you know, there are there's a subset of doctors who are like, uh, you know, haters of me, right? I mean, 
very interesting group and they're mostly female psychiatrists and they'll be saying things like, uh, well, what gives you the right to do a psychological au autopsy on a, on a um, suicide victim? And it's like, I didn't really have a good answer at the time because I'm just, I think I'm naturally, you know how some people just have innate skills. Like it's like going up to Tiger Woods and say, what gives you the right to play golf? I don't know, I can just hit it in the hole. You know what I mean? Like. <laughs> You know, so now they're like, well, what gives you the right to do? You don't have a degree in this. It's like, well, I don't know. My dad's a pathologist. My mom's a psychiatrist. So I think like I was born to do psychological autopsies. You know what I mean? Like that's the only thing I could come up with at the time, which I think pissed them off more. So um, well, you're also, I, but you're also in primary care and primary care is no stranger to, to dealing yeah. with mental health. Yeah. For 30 years, I've been helping people with mental health issues. There yeah. you go. Yeah. Well, yeah. Dr. Pamela Weibel on the show today, and there's something that I wanted to mention, and that's parents of med school students and, and residents sometimes are the last to know, and, and that much is clear from your book. I mean, they'll get a call from the police, and then they know, and that's a yeah. terrible way to find out, is it not? Yeah. And so what, did they ever, when you talk to these, I know you talk to the parents too, it, did they ever say what they would have done differently had they known more about what was going on? They would have tried to, first of all, some parents push their children into this career for the status and seemingly protection, yeah. you know? So I think there would be less cultural, uh, you know, forcing your, your, your children to go into a profession that's not right for them. If you knew that they, you were essentially sending them to something that's da more dangerous than Afghanistan with, you know what I mean? Yeah. So that one thing would change, but also you would be able to counsel your, your child about whether this is the right profession for them. You know what I mean? A lot of parents um, either try to dissuade, but they don't have the actual data to speak about why they're trying to dissuade their children from pursuing medicine. They just know it looks hard from the outside. They would actually have facts, you know, I think if they knew what they know now or from reading my book, for example, they would be able to say, look, you already had trouble with um, drug addiction in college. You know, do you think it's a good idea for you to be an anesthesiologist? You know, like that's a conversation they could actually have. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I think that they would be, this would give them, I think what my book does and having this knowledge about what really goes on in medical training is it gives parents the right to be helicopter parents. You know, like you actually have the right to call your children once or more a day and check on them and you should if they're in medical school, you know? Yeah. And it's not being um, overly protective. That's being a concerned parent uh, with, um, with a right to be concerned. That's lines of communication. The other thing that, that occurred to me is when you're in med school, you've already gone through college, now you're in med school, and you're spending a lot of money. Someone's spending a lot of money for you to go to, to med school. Either you're taking on a lot of debt or your parents are paying for it. And so the students there, the med school is, is what it is. It seems to me they might be ashamed that they might be perceived as weak or can't cut it. You know, then you've got the huge cost for school. It's very tough for a student to call a home and say, you know what, I don't know if I can do this. That's a, that's a, that's a tough call to make. And they don't have a lot of incentive to do that unless, yeah. unless they've read the book, <laughs> they've read the Bible, so to speak, your book. And Bible, both, Bible, yes. <laughs> the, the Bible, Bible. And, <laughs> and very good. I like that. <laughs> I think it, then you're, you're, you're both on the same page. You're all on the same page. The lines of communication are drawn and it's not my, this isn't my mom or my dad being annoying. This is just them being parents right? and being caring parents and just making sure. And I, I think that applies to spouses of practicing physicians. They're out of residency. Now they're, well, including residency, but if you're married and spouses need to be having this conversation as well. Dr. Pamela Weibel, author of Human Rights Violations in Medicine with us today. You're there to help docs, but I saw a couple of surprisingly cool small things that patients and people in general can do uh, that you suggest that they can do to help this situation. The two that I have in mind are thank you notes and the love letter campaign. 
Yeah, that, that's been very effective. I don't know if people are aware, but there are people, I believe it started in England, uh, a teenager who had considered stepping off a bridge uh, who decided not to, um, she left little love notes on that bridge, you know, essentially saying like, don't do it. Your life is worth it. You're precious. Like take a step back. Um, you know, people love you, whatever it is, like these little note cards that she laminated, I think, and then just like tied them to the bridge where I guess this is a pop spot for suicide and people found her wow. because those notes saved their lives and they wanted to thank her. So this isn't just like unicorns and puppy dogs, let's all hold mm. hands and sing love songs. This is actually, right. it works for preventing suicide because people are looking right. for at that last dark hour, is there anyone who really cares? Would the world really miss me? You know, to have a stranger come up to you or see a little wow. love note, you know, on the top of your hospital <laughs> where all the doctors step off, you know, like that could really change your mind, you know? Physicians are under a lot of stress. And if I'm sitting in front of my physician, if I'm a patient, and you make the suggestion that perhaps you shouldn't be like having a direct conversation about it, you can send them a note. And it's, it's, there's less of a, of a defensive mechanism that goes up because it's a very unusual type of, of conversation. Where are they going with this? Do they want extra medications? What's how are you doing, Doc? Are you feeling Are you feeling suicidal today? You know, that's not something you really want to bring up. But that thank you note, I thought, was an excellent idea. Yeah, that's pretty simple because most uh, patients have had some experience with sending thank you notes, uh, even to nurses after your child's born, or dentist, or your veterinarian. You know, or or you know, I mean, we all know how to write a thank you note. But I think if in the back of your mind you understand the person that you're writing this to is is potentially um, at some point thinking of suicide or depressed or stressed at their work, you know, like that comes from a different place than just saying, "Gee, thank you so much for saving my life." Uh, in the emergency room, like if you could add something in there, I want you to know how valuable you are, how much, you know, something that's more personal, like the way you explained my diabetes to me, it really, it really helped. Nobody else has ever taken the time to do that. And I think I can really um, change my lifestyle now, you know, like those sorts of things. The, there's also the love letter campaign. Right. And the love letter campaign was sort of built off of, well, I mean, I'm, I'm probably the first one that's actually, you know, described it as a love letter campaign. It was, uh, you know, modeled after these notes left on a bridge, I believe. Um, and then some medical students got together and they called it a compassion project. And they would just leave anonymous sort of, you're doing a great job, you know, oh, you know, thank you so much for the dedication, you know, sort of like heartfelt letters to mm -hmm. random health professionals that they would leave like in the hospital um, at the nurse's station, you know, or um, yeah, pass out somehow anonymously, you know, to other students. And, you know, it just gives you some positive affirmation that otherwise you don't generally get in medical education, which is often built on, you know, sort of noticing all your flaws and not necessarily appreciating that you saved somebody's life, right? Right. Um, so that, and then I just took it a step further and sort of called them love letters because that's just kind of spreading more how the I love, them, right? Yeah. And uh, encourage people to write love letters to med students and physicians. And I, I did a little blog post on it. But what was really funny about this is people kept sending the love letters to me as if I'm the distribution point. And it's like, well, no, really, anyone can do this. Just go drop them off at the nurses station or the, you know, I even had some patients wanting to do this around Christmas time. It's like, you know, just write they found out I was doing this. They're like, oh, I want to write love letters. Maybe we'll do that with the church. Great. We'll just drop them at the emergency department because there's people that are working on Christmas Day there who aren't feeling the love, you know, right. they're oh. seeing trauma. And if they got a package of love letters from people in town, you know, about their wonderful commitment to helping us even on Christmas Day, that would make a huge, um, huge impact on them, right? And yeah. bring some of them to tears. Right. Oh, yeah. But I think it's funny the discomfort that people have with handing out love letters that they want me to do it for them. That's well, it's, really they'll, they'll send a soldier a letter, a card. Yeah. And why, yeah. not, why not just say, you know, hey, it's a thank you card that right. a thank you, you know, a 
a Hallmark card or whatever, and they go in and they and they see the nurses' station or whatever at the ER and say, "Can you pass these out?" You know, thank you for yeah. her being here on a holiday. And there's yeah. there's another little thing I recall from a long time ago, and I asked my my late father one day. I said, "So, Dad, what are you most proud of?" And he said, "I mean, aside from my family." And I said, yeah, basically your, your professional life. And he paused for a moment and he pointed to a box on a shelf. And he said, tell you what, open the box and read what's in there. And inside the box were a whole bunch of letters from his students, column readers, because he, he was a columnist. People that he's, that he's met over the years in classes and whatnot. And they were all letters saying, thank you so much for whatever, you know, showing me a better way of doing things and, and unleashing my creativity, whatever it was. So I call it, I just called it the box. And dad would say, you know, another letter would come in. He goes, oh, that's really nice. Put it in the box. Yeah. So he would read them every now and then. Yeah. And doctors are like that. They are definitely, they, they, they're sort of a, uh compulsive about details, saving, um, you know, letters, saving notes. Many docs, docs have told me they have this box, just like your dad, uh, right? They keep their thank you notes. Um, I can read you a few quotes that I think are very relevant to sure. this from doctors whose lives have been saved from these suicide. Absolutely. Uh, from, from these notes, right? So this is, uh, this is a female physician who reports, I keep every note from my patients. It has definitely prevented my suicide. There are days I want to give up, but I see the letters, thank you cards, even art, knitting, and jewelry from patients, and I keep going. I am reminded that my life is about more than my pain and suffering. Mm. Wow. And she goes on, perhaps I have to reach out more for support and allow others, another to experience their relevance in this world by being my healer. As physicians, we think that asking for help is a sign of weakness. Our system judges us for it. Our colleagues do too. When I leave loving notes for others, I'm seen as soft and not taken seriously professionally. What a shameful and grave display of the ignorant system we are in. What if we saw asking for help as a sacred opportunity? Sure. Yeah. That's powerful stuff. And this is a male ENT uh, who got a text that prevented his suicide. And he wrote me, this is, he said, this is the text message that prevented my suicide. Hey, I'm so sorry about your patient. That sucks. I'm very thankful that we have you as an excellent otolaryngologist to learn from. You take care of so many sick patients and do a marvelous job educating us how to do it safely, skillfully, and compassionately well. Thank you for that. Just a text message. That text message saved an ear, nose, and throat doctor's life. Wow. You know, there's, there's an old saying my dad loved it. There, there's majesty and simplicity. Mm -hmm. Wow. Those, those things. You know, on a more humorous note, I handle this kind of stuff with humor. So every now and then it comes out. And as I'm reading your book, I, I don't know why it popped into my head, but the movie American Pie popped into my head. One of the characters, one of the lead characters, her, fa her, her line, one time at band camp. <laughs> so she would always begin these stories with one time at band camp. What popped into my head was pre-med school camp, because I know you do retreats for doctors who've had enough and they want to transition into something a little more fulfilling like you did. And I thought, wait a minute, what about pre-med school camp or retreat to familiarize these kids? I, I can call them kids. I'm 60. To familiarize them with what can and does happen using the book as a teaching tool and then train them in better ways of handling situations up to and including basic self-defense which ought to be a clue to anyone listening. There's a lot more going on in med school and residency than you might be aware of. And they, there's an added benefit here of going to med school with sort of a built-in support network, kind of a band of brothers. You've been through a pre-med pre school boot camp, And instead of figuring out who's in their corner or if there's anyone in their corner, they've got people already in the same boat as them. They're a band of brothers. And I think you know, you got a business there. Train the trainers because you're the, you have the brand and you have a compelling story. 
And that popped into my head. And if I knew, if I was a parent of someone, of a kid going into, my kid going into med school, I would definitely send them to a camp so that they could learn and have tools to handle these situations. And if it never comes up, great. But they may be able to help others in, in social networks. And, you know, hey, you know, did this happen? You know what? You need boom, 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 boom. You, in other words, you're multiplying yourself. You're not only trained trainers to train the med school, pre-med students. You're also training those pre-med students to, to be trainers as well. This is what I learned in band camp kind of thing. And I think you're probably the only person who could pull that off because you have the brand, if you will, and you have the compelling story and you have the book. And I wanted to mention for the listeners that can find out more about, about you at Pamela Weibel. Dot com. That's W-I-B-L-E. Or idealmedicalcare.org is great too. Either. Yeah. yeah. You know, I love what uh-huh. you said about the, the Bible Bible. <laughs> I thought that was great. And, you know, I wish you every success and strength in your important work. And thanks for joining me, Dr. Pamela Weibel. Thank you so much for having me. And I do hope that this helps anyone out there who's struggling or people who are on the fence, even about pursuing medicine as a profession, I'm happy to help you figure out whether this is the right career for you and uh, whether you're a parent or of a, of a medical student, a wife or husband of a current physician, a physician who's struggling, like, please reach out. Don't isolate. There are resources and I am happy to help in whatever way I can. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, it's a tough thing, but you're also a real shining light. To my listeners, thank you too. And that's all for now. And please join me each week as we take a deeper dive into aspects of healthcare you won't find anywhere else. And there you are. Thanks for listening to the Winning Healthcare Food Fight Show. Hit the subscribe button to hear more expert thinking on getting better care without the mess.